Um, my pleasure. And I was going to say, I'm going to begin, actually, maybe now we should begin with our poll. Have you, okay. have you all seen the poll? It's talking about, ah. Ah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. Are uh, we supposed to answer this? Are we supposed to check on it? Well, <laughs> interesting. You're supposed, oh, yeah. You're, Is it you're, a multiple uh, choice? <laughs> the first one, you can pick more than one. Um, and then the second one, you have to pick one. Okay. So it's not, it's, I, when it says multiple choice, I hope you can pick more than one. But if not, maybe you have to choose who you think of these different groups who reached um, the Americas before Columbus and then who you think went the farthest. Okay. Okay. Now, and I'm, may, may, it's the, it should be, it's, it's a, it should be the Malay O Polynesians. It's the, the people speak, <laughs> speaking the languages that were spoken in um, the Malay Peninsula and then into the Pacific. So the, okay. the Malay O Polynesians, or Any, we could just think of them as the Polynesians. All typos, all typos are due to Kathleen, not to the professor. I apologize. Uh, no, no. No, it's challenging. Um, I like the Mayo Polynesians. You know, they, they travel and put mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> on, on swordfish, <laughs> whatever they eat in the Mayo. South Seas. Um, so, no, I was going to say the, the, the reason I wanted to start with the poll, some of you I see haven't answered yet, um, so we can keep going. But this is uh, um, at this when um, classes went online, uh, we had a bunch of workshops, and then this summer I was at another set of workshops about teaching online, and uh, the people running the workshop were very enthusiastic about polls mm -hmm. as a way to uh, connect with the audience. And um, I discovered in the course of these workshops where, to tell the truth, I was spending a lot of my time reading my email or buying books on Amazon, that the <laughs> polls were the only thing that shamed me into participating. So, uh, so anyway, okay, so we'll, we'll leave that. Oh, good, 91% well, of you have voted. And we'll come back to this at the end. Right? Okay. This is, a, this is like a pre-quiz. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to tell you, the, 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 in the course of the lecture, you will learn the answers um, to, these, uh, to these questions. So, um, the, so we're gonna, I'm going to end the, do I have the power to end the poll? Let's see. I think you do, but I'm not sure it saves okay. the results. I, oh, there we are. There it okay. is. Okay. So okay. That's, that's what everyone thinks. Um, Good that you don't think that Columbus traveled the farthest. That's uh, great. And then um, I'm just going to close that if I can. Great. And now I'm going to share my screen and um, start. Uh oh. Okay. There we go. We, we still have the poll. Said, oh, okay. So, someone just said, uh oh. So um, that concerned me. The, so, ah, okay, so here's the, the book cover. And uh, I was gonna say the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, what I've learned. Oh, we did that, okay. Um, is, so the Porvu Center is Yale's teaching and learning center. And I wanted to just talk about <laughs> what they told us at this class, um, that uh, there was a lot of talk about why people get tired from Zoom which is interesting and uh, part of one of the answers, nobody knows for sure, but one of the answers is that you're missing social cues when you're, right. you, you know, you, if you were right. in a room with other people, you could look at their whole bodies and their posture and see how they're um, sitting. Whereas in Zoom, you're just looking at their faces on a screen. Um, one of my friends thinks that everybody gets tired from Zoom because you have to sit up straight and put yourself in the middle of the screen and that that can be, <laughs> Um, extremely tiring. Uh, anyway, because according to the um, this seminars I was going to, most people stop paying attention after about 10 minutes of listening. Um, we are going to um, shift. I'm going to talk in a couple of segments and stop after each one for Q&A. And so um, you can use the chat function to ask questions or you can raise your electronic hand. It's nice that there's a very small group. Um, you can raise your electronic hand and then um, I depend on somebody from the library to, uh, to, to feed me the questions. Um, but I'm gonna start, um, this is, we're in the introduction now and then we're going to um, talk about the Vikings and then we'll take our first break. Actually, that was the introduction. 
And um, I'm going to start by, uh, and tonight I'm talking about three sets of voyages, as you might be able to tell from the poll. So the Vikings, the Malayo Polynesians, and um, the Chinese, and they are all taking place around the year 1000. And so this um, map shows the voyages that the Vikings took, and you can see that they land in Iceland around 871. Maybe some of you have been to um, Reykjavik and to the museum that's called yeah. 871 plus or minus two years and about the first settlers um, in Iceland. And then uh, from Iceland, they went to Greenland. And then, um, and I was gonna say my source for this is that there are two Icelandic sagas that people usually call the Vinland sagas because they both talk about Vinland. And there's a, there was a debate about where Vinland was located. And uh, somebody in the 1830s thought that Martha's Vineyard was been quite, <laughs> quite positive that it was <laughs> Martha's Vineyard. And then um, the uh, picture became much clearer with some digs in the 1960s. Uh, the, and one thing, but looking at this map and why the Vikings were going on these voyages, there was a land shortage in Scandinavia. It, it, this was a society of war bands and the war band leaders um, often set out from to an aspiring war band leader would leave his home territory, sometimes her home territory, and go someplace else where they could lead their own band. And since there's a shortage of land, they end up leaving Scandinavia and going to first Iceland and then Greenland and um, then Vinland. The please. Um, and so this is, this is, and I was going to say, Vinland just means, the, it's, in English we would say wine, sorry, vine, we would say vine land. Um, the, uh, and this is the archaeological site that really confirmed for everyone that the Vikings had indeed been in the Americas around the year 1000. Um, it's called Lanzau Meadows, and it's, in, it's on the tip of um, Newfoundland. When you, when you go there, you, if you take the ferry, you have to take the ferry. When you get off the ferry, Canadian tourism is open at like five in the morning when the ferry lands. And uh, everyone goes in and says, how do you pronounce the name of this island? And they, to a person, they say, understand Newfoundland. Ah. So, this is, so we're, we're in Newfoundland. And you can see here that it's the tip. Let's look at the map again. Ah, sorry, let's go back. We're, so that Lanzo Meadows is right on the tip of Newfoundland. Uh, and um, it was, there were um, some dwellings there. This picture is kind of showing the scene, looking out at the site. And there um, were some mounds of covered with grass that the locals thought were the homes of um, the indigenous peoples, the First Nations. In Canada, they don't say the Amer Indians or the Native Americans, they say the First Nations. Uh, but when the archaeologists began to dig, and they began to dig in the 1960s and 1961, they found a lot of things, but the, um, their most, uh, I was going to say, their, their, um, the, the best evidence, the clearest evidence they found of the Viking presence was this pin. And um, it was used to, um, it's part of a piece of jewelry that had a ring. The ring is missing. There's just this one pin. And it was used to close the cloak, the neck of a cloak. And um, identical pins uh, have been found at sites in Iceland and in Denmark from about 920 to 1050. So anybody looking at this, it's a bronze pin. Um, and it's about three inches long. Anybody looking at that would say that has to be Scandinavian. There were other things at the site that were also Scandinavian. There was a needle sharpener. Um, there was a weight you use when you spin yarn. Um, there was actually evidence of working iron. And um, the Norse were working iron, but nobody else in the Americas was. So um, that, those, and those digs ended in 1968. And once those digs were completed, there was no question that the Norse had been um, in the Americas and at least on the northern tip of 
Newfoundland. Whether that was Vinland or not, there's some debate because it's so far north and the sagas talk about grapes growing. Vinland, that's why it has this name of Vineland and grapes don't grow, grow that far north. So I think most people think that that was maybe a boat repair station and then the Norse went farther south. How much farther south is debated, but um, went farther south, maybe just to Nova Scotia, maybe into Maine, um, and that that's where Vinland was located. So, um, so the debate, and then I was gonna say, this uh, is in Maine. This is at a place, uh, the Goddard site. And um, at, at the Goddard site is the point, the farthest south where there's been any archeological evidence of the Vikings. And um, the archeological evidence is, this is the, the um, it's a Norse penny. It's um, mostly silver. And it's funny, every time I look at it, I see a chicken head with the eye and like the, but it's actually a king's face, right? And I think that's his crown. Um, and it dates to, ten, it was made, it was minted sometime between 1065 and 1080. And um, the archeological evidence from Lansaw Meadows shows that the Vikings stayed for only about 10 years and they left in about 1010. They probably arrived in 1000 and left in 1010. So this is after, um, they left, and um, it's one of the pieces of evidence showing that the Vikings came back, even after they abandoned their settlement, they came back to the Americas where they, um, to get, to collect wood, because there was no wood in Greenland, no trees in, grew in Greenland, and in Iceland there had been some trees, but once um, there was human settlement, the tr there were no trees, and so people needed, people living in Iceland and Greenland needed lumber to build their houses. Um, but now the, the question of, is, was, was Goddard Point the farthest south that the Vikings got um, is uh, the question. And there's some evidence, which I'll show you now, and it's um, much debated. And even I would not say it's 100%, it's certainly not 100% certain. Um, but there's a question about whether or not the Vikings got to, this is the Yucatan Peninsula, and um, to a city called Chichen Itza, which was the main Maya city in the year uh, 1000. The, these, this is where the Maya had been living in the 700s and the 800s. And then there seems to be some kind of climatic disaster and they moved to Chichen Itza. Uh, and some of you may have been there. Um, this is a very famous thing that many people want to, um, <laughs> that's on people's bucket lists, that to see this building um, at the equinox um, and there's the sun forms a pattern. You can Google this and, it's, and watch videos of it, but um, the sun forms a pattern of, of forms triangles. So, and one is coming up soon on September 21st. Uh, and it looks like the body of a dragon. And then at the bottom of the stairs, there's a head of a dragon. So that's very impressive. And it reminds us that the Maya were great builders, but also great astronomers, uh, that they were very attentive to the skies. Now, um, there's a huge ball court at um, Chichen Itza. Here's a person to give you a sense of scale. And uh, it's the largest ball court uh, found at any Mayan site. There were about 40,000 people living there. And then there was this building, and this is the Temple of the Warriors. It's a huge building. And um, because so many people go to Chichen Itza, uh, you're no longer allowed to climb into um, the building. But in the past, uh, archaeologists were able to get in there in the 20s and 30s, and um, they made some watercolor studies of murals that were very heavily damaged at the time and lying on the floor. And so this is a detail of um, a possible Viking with blonde hair, his arms bound behind him, light-colored eyes, his ears are um, unusual. Uh, one of my colleagues um, named Mary Miller is an expert in Mayan um, iconography. And um, they're not Mayan ears because the Mayans had flanges in their ears. So it's a foreigner's, um, an outsider's ear. I mean, it could be somebody from the Americas. It doesn't have to be somebody from Scandinavia. Um, that drawing, this is the original study 
of these paintings to just show you what um, the evidence looks like. Here's a, another captive. We know that because the Maya put blue beads in the hair of captives. Um, this scene, I mean, these are, I, I understand that these are all heavily damaged. Uh, I mean, th these are reproductions of heavily damaged paintings, right? And of course, we all wish we could see the originals or the originals had been photographed in a way that we could study them, but that um, didn't, the circumstances did not pr permit that in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, this seems to be a scene, and it's a naval battle scene. Um, this is another captive floating in the water. This fish looks like he's about to snap off his hand. And this may be um, a, a Viking vessel, maybe a, a Maya boat. The, the Maya had dug out canoes as did almost all the peoples, the indigenous peoples in the Americas. Um, this is a different painting it's from a different building at Chichen Itza called um, the Nunnery, Las Monjas. And uh, this is an interesting painting because it shows a boat and then you can see that the boat I'm showing you here, it has planks, very clearly marked planks. The technical word is strakes. And uh, none of them, no indigenous peoples in the America made boats with planks, except for some people in California called the Chumash. So in some ways, this, this evidence of the boat may be more convincing than the um, evidence of the uh, blonde hair captives. The people who don't think that the captives were uh, Vikings say that the blonde hair is an artistic technique to distinguish the captives from the captors. So like the, that people looking at the uh, paintings would have realized that it was, I mean, there were just two groups of people. It's a way of an artistic convention for showing two groups of people and that they didn't necessarily, the real people in the battle who lost the battle, they didn't necessarily have blonde hair. Um, here's the, um, there, these, we know exactly what the Norse boats looked like because before they converted to Christianity around the year 1000, and then that took centuries for them to uh, complete, um, they buried the dead in boats that had been used in real life. So um, here's a, one example of a Norse boat that you can visit if you go to Oslo, it's right outside of the city. Um, and so, uh, so you can see, this is our first, our first break for Q&A about um, the Vikings and how far they went and whether the evidence of their being in the Yucatan Peninsula is convincing to you. So let me stop sharing. And how are we doing on, let's see, ah, okay. I don't, does anyone have questions? Sure, I have a Good. question. Uh, why did the Vikings return to their homelands? Instead of staying in the Americas? Yeah. We, we, we um, the, the Icelandic sagas tell us that they decided to leave after a particularly vicious battle with the local peoples. So that's one, I think, possible answer. Um, the places that they stayed, they stayed in Iceland and they stayed in Greenland. And both of those places, when they arrived, there was nobody there. So they seemed to prefer uh, empty places, unpopulated places. Uh, the other thing is that the um, New Finland, even today, is an incredibly poor place. And so um, there were furs, and we know that they, there's an account of them trading furs uh, with the local peoples for, um, the local peoples gave them furs and they, in one of the accounts they traded red cloth, which is, was prized in actually in a bunch of different places in the world um, in the year 1000, because it was unusual. Uh, and then in one of the, the other accounts says they gave them milk and, and milk products. So um, the, there's no description of any goods in the Americas that were very valuable. The furs, people liked the furs, but um, they, weren't, uh, they weren't that valuable. And then the um, Norse were always were sending ships back to Norway um, to obtain things that they needed to survive, like metal, like um, daggers and uh, swords. So um, I think it's probably a combination of encountering the native peoples and fighting with them um, and having pro conflicts with them 
uh, and then also that the economics just may not have been appealing enough. Okay. And I've I got a question. question. Oh, uh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. No, you, you go, Carolyn. I, I had a question about they came back for logging. I think you said yeah. that they came back to get wood. That was to Maine. I mean, is there a there were they came back? They probably came back to Labrador and Nova Scotia and Maine. Oh, you know of that whole. They were. It's, I think it's most likely that they were active all over that region. Um, to, to and how long did that go on for? Probably up, up till about 1400, because huh. um, one of the things that happens is that there, the, so the Vikings settle in southern Greenland, and then in the northern Gre in Greenland, there's this group of people called the Thule. It's like the Thule. I always thought it was pronounced Thule, but the Thule arrive, and they've come all the way from Alaska. It's an astonishing migration across the ice. And um, they get as far as Greenland and they start moving south in Greenland and they eventually defeat the Norse and expel the Norse. The, the Thule know how to hunt better. They hunt better than the Norse because they can hunt baby seals year round. Um, and so we have records of the Norse pulling out of Greenland around 1400. And that's probably when they stop going to the Americas for lumber. For lumber, uh-huh. Do you believe that Lonsla Nettles was a secondary uh, settlement and that the main settlement was further south? Yes, I mean, there, it's funny, there's, in, when you read the, the sagas, one of them mentions two places. They talk about a place where Leaf landed and then another place where they traveled to the south and they saw the grapes, the wild grapes growing. Mm -hmm. The other saga talks about three places. So I, I don't think Lonsla Meadows is mentioned in the sagas. But um, the archaeological, there, oh, there's actually archaeological evidence from Lansaw Meadows that they went farther south because they found some butternuts at Lansaw Meadows. And butternuts are, basically grow in the same regions that the wild grapes do. And so um, it seems likely that they went farther south and then uh, brought the butternuts back to Lansaw Meadows. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, Dr. Sarah Parchek, using satellite imaging, thought she yeah. found a sec another settlement, and I volunteered to help excavate it, and I'm glad they didn't pick me because that turned out to be uh, just natural formations and not Viking yeah, it was, walls. It was, a box I mean, it was so exciting when she found it by looking yeah. at the satellite pictures, and then it turned out um, not to pan out. And um, Mike, I have a uh, maybe this is an omen, but the two people who helped me a lot with this book, one of them was Mary Miller, and then the other one is a Scandinavian historian named Anders Winroth, who's just taken a job um, at Norway. I was going to say maybe it's an omen that neither of them is at Yale anymore, but uh, <laughs> Anders Winroth said when Sarah Parchak's discovery came out and then was, tur you know, turned out there was no concrete evidence of the Norse there, he said any place that was any good what people would have gone in the year 1000 and then people would have come later right. and lived on top of it and destroyed all the earlier evidence. So I think that's an interesting idea that her site, you know, she might have been right about that site. It's just that no, she wasn't. No evidence and later left. she admitted that it was just natural formations. Yeah, but, but, was, but I was gonna say they never found anything. They found some evidence, later evidence of occupation there. So, um, so that's an interesting idea that the Norse were you know, in other places and that the evidence just doesn't survive because they went to attractive places that um, other people decided to go to. I got a question for you. Um, the, what's the, what are the alternative theories of the boats with planks for, in Chichen Itza? If it, if it wasn't the Vikings who got there, have people got alternative theories? Yeah, I hate to tell you this theory because it's, it's a, um, it, it, uh, let, me, let me go back to the slide and show you. Basically, the argument is that it isn't a boat. What is? If you look at this, it's a very hard painting to understand, but um, there's, there's a view that you're not looking at a boat I, I mean, I think you are. I think you're sitting in these, these men are sitting in a boat holding their shields. Um, and I, my explanation would be these are, the Maya have taken over the boat from the Vikings. But there's another point of view, which is that it's not a boat, it's a wall. Hmm. And if it's a wall, then um, yes, you know, it could be made out of planks. 
as long as it's a boat made out of planks, it's either the Norse or this people from California, the Chumash, who, and it seems highly unlikely to me that the Chumash would have arrived there. But I guess that would be an alternative um, theory that, you know, that maybe mm -hmm. somebody we don't know about was yeah. making boats with those strakes um, in yeah, them. Also, I got a second question. Um, I don't know if you were going to uh, get to this, but in this book that I read, um, uh, Cod by Mark Kolansky. Yeah. You know, um, you know, he talks a lot about Basque fishermen coming, right. fishing off the coast and throwing their fish up onto the rocks all along the, that coast uh, for years and years and keeping a secret because they didn't want other Europeans to know about the rich fishing banks. Right. Um, is there, first of all, is that true as far as you know? And secondly, were other people sort of having that kind of contact with the Americas where they didn't really settle but sort of knew something was here? That, I mean, I, I, I was going to say the, um, there's the Basque fishermen and there's also fishermen from Bristol, British fishermen. So um, John Cabot is the person we've heard of. But I mean, it's very plausible, I think, that these cod fishermen were following schools of fish and could have reached the Americas or at least the fishing grounds off the Americas. Uh, people have looked really hard to see if there's any evidence of that before 1492 and there isn't. And that's where Kurlansky says, and there are earlier historians who also said this, that they were keeping the location of the fishing ground secret. So that to me is a very plausible example of a group who could have made it to the Americas and we just don't have any pre-1492 documentation. Also, they were fishermen. They were, they were probably illiterate, right? But um, that, that I think is very compelling. You, you um, may have heard, I, maybe getting ahead of myself, but um, there was a, this big book called 1421 that argued mm -hmm. that the Chinese got to the Americas. And um, that I think just has absolutely no basis. <laughs> so I say that as somebody who's gone through the book quite carefully and looked at all that, the evidence that um, he presented, so. So I have another um, question. So that the, I, I believe you said at one point that it was far easier to sail from the, well, the New World from um, Labrador, from Maine, and so forth, back to Norway, back to the um, mainland than it was to sail over, to go west. Far easier to go east with the prevailing winds than it was to go west. Is that true? That's true. They, it's, they, it's the main thing is there, there are currents called the gyres, and yes. the, um, the North Atlantic gyre runs uh, clockwise. So that's why it was easier to go home, because the gyre, you could catch the the gyre in Maine, say, and it would take you to Scandinavia. If you were sailing in the opposite direction, you really had to hug the shore to stay away, for, to avoid that ocean current. So you could sail um, eastward without having to stop at land, without having to hug the shore. They were, yes, right. But I think you, I mean, the, every, everything we know about the Norse sailors is that they did stop on the shore. Okay. That they they and they, they they weren't using any navigational instruments, so they just went as far as they could see. <laughs> and, and did the Basque and, too? The Basque? Do that? What do we think that the Basque would have done that, and the sailors for I Bristol think, too? I, I mean, I, I'm my I, I I don't know how much we know about them, but I would think that they're following the fish. The fish. They're going where the fish are going, right. and and you know, so that's just a a classic hunting pattern. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting, right? Um, oh, it's fascinating. Good, good. Okay, so we um, keep going. I'm going to go back to share screen. You'll be glad to know, those of you who are looking at your clock, that the um, talk, this first part is the longest part. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, okay, so now I want to talk about these Malayo Polynesians and the um, key thing to know about them is we, we, have, we just know so much less about them than we know about the Vikings. There's no equivalent of the Icelandic sagas. Uh, so um, we're dependent on archeology span and um, the, this is, we're looking at the Pacific Triangle and we can see that there were two waves of migration. Um, and the first one is taking place in these dates, so right around just after 1000 to central Polynesia. And then 
sometime in maybe the late 1100s or the late 1200s, somewhere in there, um, it seems as though the people living in Polynesia fanned out in all directions. And the three places they ended up and landed, because we know this because we have archaeological evidence, so is Hawaii and Easter Island and New Zealand. So um, these are remarkable voyages. These are about from, um, these are like from here to here is about 4,000 miles. So these are very long distance voyages. We, we don't even know what kind of boats they were in because there's no archeological evidence um, about the boats. The, the main evidence we have is linguistic, is the distribution of languages in the Polynesian family all over uh, the Pacific Triangle. So that um, the example, because it's, it's, uh, the example I give in the book is that the word kabu in, in Polynesian is the same as our word taboo. It's like, and that was one of the dialects. So you can see that, that kind of vocabulary is spread um, all over Polynesia. Um, this is the kind of boats that the po Polynesians were sailing in when Cook encountered them in the late 1700s in the South Seas. Um, I, I love this painting, but there are a lot of things I can't explain to you, like why they're wearing these headdresses and it even looks like a mask here. But the things that people know from later Polynesian ships is that there's two canoes, two canoes that were attached to each other. They've got a sail between them. And then there's a frame, it's impossible to see on this, in this painting, but there's a frame, usually a frame between the two canoes that allowed them to carry um, a lot of goods. And one of the reasons that we think this is deliberate settlement and not simply being blown off course uh, is that there, we know women were on these boats and we know that they were traveling with animals and seeds. So it seems pretty clear that the intent was to colonize. The question of how they knew where they were um, is all of the information we have is fairly modern. Um, this man named Mao Pialog, uh, it's a picture of him, he's now dead um, in 1983. Um, and he had a traditional upbringing in Micronesia and learned this traditional system of navigation. And um, he describes, there's a wonderful book called The Last Navigator by um, Steve Thomas, the guy who hosted um, This Old House. It's a really, before he hosted This Old House, he spent several years studying navigation with Mao um, in Micronesia. And it, it involves memorizing the different pictures of the sky. Each of these is the chart. There are different constellations represented by these rocks. And you memorize a whole bunch of different skies that you might see when you're in the Pacific, depending on what time of year it is and where you are. Um, you look at the waves, you pay attention to birds, you look at plants. I mean, it's a whole system. And um, the system, this is Mao was using it to navigate. And uh, he traveled, there's a mistake here, he traveled from Tahiti to Maui um, in 1976 using this system and he had never done the trip before. So it was just, that's testimony to the system. And when Cook arrived in the South Seas, he met a navigator who told him about the location of 130 different islands, including New Zealand. So you know, I'm jumping from the late, information from the late 1700s back to the 1100s and the 1200s. But if we reconstruct, it, is a, it seems to me a plausible reconstruction that that is how um, the Polynesians uh, did this. The, um, so we, I was talking about the Moleo Polynesian settlement of the Pacific. They went in the opposite direction too. They went from the Malay Peninsula all the way to Madagascar. And um, this is a picture of Madagascar. <laughs> Somebody, people, whenever I show this stuff, they're like, the Daily Mail? That's not a very good source, but it's a good picture. Uh, and it allows us to see the cultivation of rice in Madagascar. Um, people also grow mung beans. So the diet in Madagascar was very influenced by Southeast Asia. And then here we have linguistic evidence also that the language people speak on Madagascar, Malagasy, is related. It's in this, it's related to the ancestors of the Malaysian languages people speak on the Malay Peninsula. And if you, this map shows how they probably went. Again, it's a reconstruction. We don't have any archeology span showing any shipwrecks or anything um, en route, but um, we know people speaking a language in that family started here 
and we know they ended on uh, Madagascar. So those are very impressive, uh, very impressive journeys. Yes, I was going to say here's our second break <coughs> for questions about the Malayo Polynesians. Valerie? Yes. This is Susie. Um, do you lend any credence to Betty Meggers theories about the Javon Japanese pottery being found in South America four or five thousand years ago? And if, so, if so, how the hell did it get there? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there's, there's, um, there's lots of, and a, and a lot of the evidence of 1421 is like that too. This motif looks like that motif. Therefore, there must have been contact. And sometimes the similarities are very striking, but in the motifs, but the timing is always terrible, right? This motif from 3000 BC looks like that motif from 1500 AD. So, um, no, I don't. You don't, okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll keep going. You're, you're are, we, are we supposed to end in two minutes? Oh, no, could no, I no. Ask you can go on for as wait. long as you want to. We can go no, on no, all no. evening, all night, if you'd like. Could That's I ask extremely polite wait, of you, wait. but yeah, Rachel? Yes. Uh, were they literate, the Malayo Polynesians? No. So no, they no. did not leave any writ written records. Right. And there's not even um, any transmitted oral accounts about these voyages. The Icelandic sagas I was telling you about were first transmitted orally and then they're written down in the 1200s and the 1300s, but there's nothing like that. So really mm -hmm. we just have to, it's just the archaeological evidence and the linguistic evidence um, that lets us f figure out where they, where they might have gone and how they might have gone there. Isn't there um, a bit of a bias, a Western bias towards any people that did not were not literate um, and therefore we discount their um, accomplishments achievements um, is that still prevalent you think yeah but i mean i think things are changing there's a mm -hmm. I, I wrote years ago i wrote a world history textbook and there's um, all the world history textbooks, you can put them on a scale from Eurocentric to global. And the, I, was try, <laughs> I was trying to write one uh, on the global side of things. But, you know, the global books will, will have lots of coverage of the Polynesians and, and, the, and their ability to navigate and this incredible system. So um, I think historians are more comfortable with written evidence, but a lot of the work done on the Polynesians was done by anthropologists who uh, <laughs> hung out with these navigators and tried to figure out what the system was. So I don't, I mean, there, there's, you know, there's more positions teaching French history than there are teaching Polynesian navigation in, in American academy, uh, the um, American academia, but there's some people who have, who study Polynesian navigation who've got jobs. So I, I think I, I think I think things are improving. I don't I don't think it's so bad. Great, great, good to I hear. I have a question. Um, so that we know that from um, Arabia, they went on to the mainland of Africa, off opposite from Madagascar. Um, but according to your book, but did this sort of Asian cuisine or culture or customs at all transplant itself from Madagascar onto the mainland of Africa? No, there, well, it's interesting, the archaeologists found, they find evidence of the Asian cuisine, surprise, in the big ports. Okay. okay. <laughs> so where they think that, like, people were coming from India. That's right. Okay. Right? And, 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 and so um, those ports, those Indian Ocean ports were really active entrepots. But right. beyond those ports, no, they don't find evidence of the Malaysian, the rice diet, or the oh. mung beans going into um, into Africa. Africa. Um, okay, back for our final group, uh, the Chinese, who are close to my heart, since I am, uh, by training, a Chinese historian. Okay, so the first thing is um, to just show you this route that was linked to China with um, the Persian Gulf 
in, um, it starts, that we start to see traffic on it all the way from across, all the way from um, here, from Basra to Guangzhou, a major port. It used to be called Canton. Uh, you may know it as Canton uh, in South China. Uh, starts around 750 or 800. And then um, trade along this route continues um, up to 1492 and certainly after it. It's the most heavily trafficked sea route in the world before uh, the European voyages. And the, um, I was gonna say, we're, here is around the Straits of Malacca, right? Right by, this is Singapore um, is there. We have uh, some archeological evidence. There's a lot of Chinese shipwrecks have been found in this part of the world. We also have some textual evidence and, and a lot of Chinese records about, um, well, I was gonna say we have records of exchanges between the governments of different societies uh, in this part of the world and China. Uh, we don't have too many descriptions about boats. We have some, I'll tell you about one book that's very interesting. Um, the Chinese in the year 1000 are uh, consumed with importing, um, they use this catch-all word, xiang, which is, means aromatics, and it includes fragrant woods like sandalwood. Um, it includes spices like cloves. Uh, it includes some natural products like these kingfisher birds have these bright blue feathers. Chinese were um, importing a lot of kingfisher feathers. This is um, turtle shell that we're all familiar with from uh, eyeglasses, right? Uh, and the, uh, this is a civet cat. If you all remember, if we can remember SARS, the, the civet cat was the, um, supposed to be the animal that transmitted it uh, to humans. And uh, we know that these aromatics were popular, not just among the wealthy in China, but really for everybody, and especially people living on the coast. Um, and so the Chinese are importing all of these goods. They start off um, importing them from the Arabian Peninsula, but they shift to Southeast Asia around the year 1000. And then the Chinese are exporting. Ceramics are their big export, and they leave um, a very clear archaeological footprint. And so do metal ingots and metal objects like wax and cauldrons, mirrors. Um, fabrics are, tend to um, dissolve in water. So we know much less about um, Chinese exports of these, of cloth. But we know that China is a manufacturing power then, like now. Um, but then, of course, there's no electricity. There's no steam power. So people are making these things in workshops. And workshops, I think, in English implies a small place where people are working. These were huge places where thousands of people worked uh, making. So, you know, uh, I was going to say making ceramics on um, wheels. So they're kicking the wheels. They're human-powered wheels. And then firing them in ver to a very high temperature um, using... Uh, wood or charcoal or even um, coal sometimes. Coal and coke. And um, one of the, I was telling you about the, some of the written sources we have that uh, we have a written account by the son of a port official who told us that um, boats could figure out where they were by using a south pointing needle. And this is a reconstruction of a Chinese compass. Uh, that was made with um, annealed iron and floated in water on a ship. The Chinese had the compass um, on uh, like a lodestone made out of a, a natural stone uh, that they had it from before, uh, you know, the common, turn of the common era. But around the year 1000, they start to put it on ships. So, um, and, and Zhu, Zhu Yu, this man who's telling us about the Chinese navigation, um, they knew the outline of the coast from experience they could look at the sun's shadow to determine their direction. Um, they collected samples of mud from the ocean floor. And um, I was, I'm very interested in this. And I was uh, talking, I gave this talk um, to a different group. And um, one of the people there said he had studied navigation and that um, you also now modern navigators will do that. Take a sample of the ocean floor beneath the boat to see what it tells them. I, I'm, I'm curious to find out what, what you can learn from these samples of mud. And so um, this is an account that tells us something about the navigators and how, how they were able to move. So they are, they are of the 
three groups I'm talking about, the Vikings and the Malayo Polynesians and the Chinese, the Chinese are the only ones using navigational instruments and they're using the compass most importantly. Um, we've got archeological evidence. This is a ship from the 1270s that was excavated um, in the Cultural Revolution. It's in Quanzhou, which is the, in the book I talk a lot about Guangzhou, Nei Canton, and then also Quanzhou. And um, one of the things you can see here is, oh, I thought I had a different picture, but you can see the wooden compartments here in the ship. And that was one of the breakthroughs in Chinese navigation that if the ship, ship sprang a leak, it could be contained to just one part of the boat. So that made the boats much more resilient. And uh, it was also, you could, if you wanted to, you could raise, you could um, have a fish pond in the boat so that the sailors could eat fish. So they had a much <laughs> easier time on those boats than let's say Columbus's sailors who were just eating hardtack for their whole, their whole voyage. Here's the Chinese route um, and with the distances and you, should know. So the answer to my poll question about who went the farthest is the Chinese went the farthest, especially if they went to Basra and then went um, down the coast of East Africa, south to Sofala. Um, Columbus's trip is around 4,400 miles. And so just that one leg there is already longer than um, Columbus's trip. The um, one thing about if you look at this map of where the Chinese went, um, is that I'm not talking about they're going, um, I always have to think about east and west, um, going east into the Pacific. Uh, the Chinese go to the Philippines and that's pretty much as far as they go um, into the Pacific. And part of the reason I think is that this whole route um, generated, you know, this is the Spice Islands. There were so many things they wanted and they could trade. There was no need for them to go in the other direction. But they also had this belief um, in this kind of, well, I was gonna say mystical, but from their point of view, it was quite real. The ultimate drain, they thought all the water in the ocean came from one place. And then I don't know where they thought the water came from. And then it all drained out um, somewhere around the Philippines. And um, it seems likely that it was in this area was the location of this uh, ultimate uh, drain and so um, and we have descriptions um, from the uh, that book I was telling you about the Jew, the book by the port, the son of the port official that um, all the water um, that sailors got close to this ultimate drain close enough that they could hear this terrible noise of the draining and then the wind came up and they were able to escape so um, the so that's one of the so you know the where the the Malayo Polynesians go into the Pacific the Chinese never go there um, all of this area now is um, where the the South China Sea where there's the Chinese have been building these been building these man-made islands and um, it's a source of great controversy international controversy right with um, Vietnam and the Philippines uh, suing. Um, the Chinese in inter at the Hague at the court, um, the International Justice Court in the Hague, and winning their case, the judges ruled that the Chinese had no right to be there, but they are still there. They have not, they did not respect that ruling. So we get to the end of the lecture. Um, the uh, the only people I think there's credible evidence of reaching the Americas before Columbus is the Vikings, and then those Basque and Bristol fishermen. I do think that that's. There's no hard evidence, but it's, it's uh, nothing as good as Lansdowne Meadows, but it's quite plausible. Um, some people think the Malayo Polynesians may have traveled from Easter Island to Chile. And you may have seen in the New York Times, there was some, a DNA study recently that suggested that, but there's still a lot of people who, the, um, I personally don't find the DNA studies that convincing because the, you can look at somebody's DNA and see what their ancestry is, but you can't see when their ancestors were in a given place. Um, and so the, for the moment, I would say the only hard evidence of pre-Columbian uh, visitors to the Americas is the Vikings. And then in terms of who went the farthest, it's the Chinese because that route I showed you is so much longer than um, anything where Columbus went um, or the Vikings or um, the Malayo Polynesians. I guess with the Malayo Polynesians, if somebody had gone from Easter Island all the way to 
Polynesia, and then to New Zealand, and then to Madagascar, you might say that they, um, that's a very long route as well. But um, our, my sense, and everybody's sense from this is that they, those were three different legs, and that um, boats would have only traveled on one of those legs, where we have evidence that the Chinese were traveling all the way from their ports of Guangzhou and Quanzhou to um, the Islamic world, and then south to East Africa. So um, we are, that is the end of my talk. Be glad to take some questions. So you think that is further than if the Vikings had gone all the way down to South America? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, no, no, you're right. I should, I should calculate how far that would be. That isn't, that doesn't add that much. That, that, uh, from, does anybody know offhand the, the distance from Florida to Maine? <laughs> no, it's, unfortunately, these Florida things are Maine. very easy to calculate these days. But that's so, Florida, uh, then Florida to Chichen Itza or whatever. <laughs> right, right. I, one, one of the things that, um, I learned in the course of, um, and I, w I went to Chichen Itza just for like four or five days, but I, I loved it. The, uh, there was, um, I'm trying to remember when it was, but there was a move to make the Yucatan Peninsula a state. So <laughs> that was something I, I had not been aware of. So it's sort of like, oh, that would be interesting. We could all be traveling there, could be part of the United States. The, uh, I should know more about that. Interesting. I Google it, find out when that was. <laughs> Um, Valerie, I have a question. Um, I've just barely started reading your book, but um, uh, I, I love it. Thank I you love, for, thank you for buying it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, but you said something right at the very beginning of your book um, that I just want to ask you about. You said the Vikings connected pre-existing trade routes across the Americas with those of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Right. That was on page two. Um, when you say they connected them, you, this is applying a connection from the western portion of North America to the eastern portion of North America. Who's making that connection? That's, oh, well, it's so exciting. You're, you're going to find that out in chapter three. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's all the, um, that's the, the teaser. There are, there, there's all these um, Native American roots crisscrossing North America. And, and so, so, for example, there's a route connecting Chaco Canyon in New Mexico with Chichen Itza, where the um, Chichen Itza, they're exporting, the people there are exporting chocolate because the Maya know how to, they're the only people in the Americas making chocolate. Um, they're, also, they're also exporting bird feathers, brightly colored macaw feathers, they're like red and green. Um, and then the people who are in Chaco Canyon are exporting turquoise. So the those routes, yeah, that's one of the big arguments in the book is that there's a set of trade routes in the Americas and there's a comparable set of trade routes in the Africas that um, are created and exist before the Europeans arrive and that the Europeans are able to plug into them, but they're, they're already existing. So kind of like China, they already had their globalization, the United States and South America. Yeah, that's, that's the contention of the book that these places were, I mean, you know, it's not globalization, like people couldn't go into Ikea and buy um, furniture, right, I mean, made on the opposite side of the world. But people in, you know, certainly in those Chinese ports in Southeast Asia, the Islamic world, um, they're living in societies where there's a, they're likely to meet people from far away. They can, some of the goods they can buy are from far away. Uh, there's a huge slave trade all over the world. I mean, it, I shouldn't say we don't know that. I don't know that about the Americas, but there's a huge slave trade around Afro, across Afro-Eurasia of slaves being um, sold and Af slaves from Africa, I think we all expect that, but slaves from Scandinavia and from Eastern Europe and also slaves from Central Asia coming into um, the Islamic world. So there's a lot of movement that people just don't know about. I mean, people today don't know about. How does it compare the um, the routes, uh, the travel that went across the Indian Ocean with the export and the trade that went across overland on your original, you know, you, your first book or another book was on the Silk Route overland? It's, it's a lot easier to carry, carry cargo in a boat than it is overland. So the scale of the trade is just huge. The maritime trade 
is much bigger. One, one of the shipwrecks um, found the Chinese ships. It actually isn't a Chinese ship. It's a, um, a Southeast Asian ship, but it's found it has 600,000 Chinese ceramics in it. There's nothing like that on the Silk Road, the overland routes. It's just too, too much to carry, but you can put it in the hull of a ship and, tr and it can move a great distance. Right. And the spread of religion? I mean, I know Buddhism spread overland. Right. A lot of the religions do seem to spread overland. I guess the Polynesians, when the Malayo Polynesians are taking their religions with them, the, uh, but the, the, the spread of religions that we know about is almost, um, is almost always overland. I don't know, that's interesting. Um, maybe because there's no people on the water, so we just don't know what's going on. But you do <laughs> talk in your book about how, you know, there were Buddhist temples and the spread of Hinduism at the various ports in which the Chinese or the right. Indians, you know, would settle and stop for a while, and then they would build a religious community and then go on. So, um, you know, that's very true. There is, the, the mariners are bringing religions to the ports. Um, but sometimes the religions, it's a little bit like the food, that question about whether people in Africa were influenced by the um, Indian food. Uh, they were, those, some of those religions in the ports just stay in the ports. That's where the foreign communities are. They don't go um, inland. The, the thing that really changes people's religious lives is when rulers convert to a new religion and, and, and force all of their subjects to convert. Which you also bring up as a major factor. Yeah. In, of the year 1000, which I thought was absolutely yeah. fascinating. Um, well, that's very kind of you. I was going to say, I do get to be sort of like a broken record. <laughs> I, have, I have a certain number of points I'm trying to, uh, to drive home. So. The, um, can, uh, when, when you uh, showed those trade routes coming from China and ending up in Basra, um, yeah. was it, you know, like my impression of, of like Silk Road trading was that people weren't going the same person from the beginning of the Silk Road to the end of it. They were going to the next big city right. selling stuff and the next person brought it to the next big city and sold it. When yeah, no, that, 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 um, is, that's certainly my impression of the Silk Road trade too. Um, we actually have evidence of the boats. I mean, the, um, and this is something I want to work on, but uh, we know for sure in the 1400s that the Chinese send a fleet from uh, a different port, Nanjing, all the way to East Africa. So we, we have um, boats going, doing that whole distance. And there's earlier evidence of that. Uh, there's a map from like the 1200s that shows um, going all the way from China to Hormuz, a port in Iran. So um, the, they may stop at some of the ports to refuel, but it is different than the Silk Road trade that they keep going. And, the, and we know that the Chinese ceramics are getting all the way to the East African coast. Um, now, you could argue that those ceramics are transshipped, but I, uh, there's the evidence. The, late, the evidence from the 1400s is for sure that Chinese ships are taking them all that way. Any more questions? Well, could you explain to me the log and plank lug or something? There's a type of boat construction. <laughs> I, could not, I could not figure this out. <laughs> okay, the lashed lug construction. I wanted to have a diagram of it, but I couldn't find a good diagram. Um, people in Southeast Asia did not use nails. That's the first key point. So the question is how to attach two planks together. And what they did was carve a dowel like or a wooden knob um, that's the lug um, on, a, on a board so just think of two boards can you see my hands here let's say that there's a a little knob a knob here and then a knob on this finger here and then the two you would put the boards flush and then take string and connect the two knobs instead of a nail so you would tie the the planks together that's lashed lug construction. And although it may seem hard for us to imagine because why not just use nails, um, they didn't have nails and they were go. able to make this work and to build quite large wooden ships with it. And we have archeological evidence of those lashed lug vessels. Did they use any kind of waterproofing substance between the boards or at the edges? Yeah, like pine resin. Okay. 
and cloth. They would put cloth in and then um, usually like pine resin. Uh, or I, I say pine, actually it's, there's no pine trees in the tropics. There's a, a, I'm thinking of a, there's a Southeast Asian term. I don't know what kind of a tree it is, but anyway, some kind of tree resin um, on the cloth between the boards. I have one other question, but I, I'm a little hesitant to ask it without having read more of the book, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, the word globalization, it, yes. it's very au courant, but I mean, when we talk about globalization today, we're talking about like massive movements of labor, of capital, immigration, right. technology, ideas. It, it's, I don't know, it just strikes me like in the year a thousand is like, isn't it such a different order of connection that like, using that same word is a little bit of a stretch? Yeah, I mean, it may be. I was gonna say historians tend to say there's a one wave of globalization from like the 1970s to now, right? And that's the one I think we're all familiar with. But then the question is, when does it start, right? And that, that would be my answer that you, that, um, if we're looking at when this all began, that we should be going back to the year 1000. We shouldn't be waiting till 1500 or even, you know, the industrial revolution because the movement of people and goods and ideas was affecting people around the world as early as 1000. Um, I, I, yes, I, I definitely agree it's a stretch, but you know, one of the reasons I love history is that uh, you, you get money for being provocative. <laughs> <laughs> but you also I mean, said it's when globalization began so it's yes right <laughs> i mean i i have a when i was writing the silk road book i have a friend who's a very talented french historian of the silk road and at one point he said to me you know we've just got to stop saying silk road because of course there's no silk is not the main thing on the road nobody used this word at the time there's all these problems with the term he said, we're just going to call it Overland Central Asian Trade. And I said, well, and no one is going to read it. <laughs> right? it's like, so, so, you know, that's, I think that's part of what is going on. Fair enough. Well, well thank you all. You were a great audience. And uh, I appreciate it. I've, I've never read a book like this before, and I'm not like super into history, but I read this in about three days, and oh. it was very readable. Oh, that's and very kind of you to say. It, and it was, I mean, I, I got a little bit in the weeds in the China part, but um, because it gets well, very complicated. It, well, I, I got all the way. I, the only thing I haven't read yet is the epilogue. Ah. But, um, but it's, uh, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Oh, that's very kind of you to say. Oh, I, Beverly, I, I yeah. will, you, will you promise uh, to come here in the flesh? and chat with us in a, another program live? Sure, that was my pleasure. When, when, are, when is this gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, <laughs> yeah. when you can get rid of the virus. When we have a vaccine, right? <laughs> By the flesh, you mean the electronic flesh? Well, yeah. we have, I, I wanna say that she has very generously offered to come to the next meeting of our History Book Group. And for those of you who are not in it, okay, please do come because it's going to be September 8th. We'll have to, if that date works with you, Valerie, if you want to look at your calendar. Oh, yeah, we'll I, I talk do. Need about to her it. book. And um, it's in the evening, and I, there's a number of people in today who came who are part of that group. And it's just a wonderful, fun group. And so if you've read the book, you know, we have lots of copies, and it's a wonderful read. And so join us. Join us on the eighth, and um, we'll get you a copy of the book if you well, have. We'll start with a about a twenty-five minute quiz and IDs and. <laughs> yeah. SM. Okay, sounds good, right? Yeah. <laughs> then we'll all run for the hills. <laughs> okay. Hold We're just time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll check. I'll check my calendar about the eighth. It's funny you seem to have a uncanny ability to get close to the family birthday so let me I need well to, then uh, we can change the date okay, okay. We, we can do that and work with you all right no problem. great okay uh, my pleasure nice okay. nice thank to talk to all much. of you and thank have, you have so a, much it was great bye bye thank you bye thanks carolyn thank oh, you carolyn thank you